My name is Mary Knight. I'm a survivor of ritualistic child abuse, child sex trafficking, incest, and other extreme forms of child abuse. I did have a horrendous childhood, which included I was used in child pornography. I was also sex trafficked by being taken to uh, motel rooms of men, by being sold to in my front yard of uh, my childhood home, close to my swing set. I actually saw men hand money to my mother. It was a group of men, and I was sexually assaulted. This happened throughout my childhood, including my teenage years. I remember being brought to hotel rooms of men as a teenager. Some of my abuse could be considered satanic ritual abuse. I know that's a controversial term. My definition of satanic ritual abuse is that it is extreme abuse, physical and sexual, and that it involves multiple perpetrators and or multiple child victims, which mine did. My earliest memory is of being sexually abused, sexually abused by my father. I, I was also sexually abused by my mother. I was sexually abused by other family members, grandparents. And one thing that I would consider satanic ritual abuse is I was put in a coffin. I was put in a coffin with my sister's body. She died when she was 11 and I was nine. What I remember about it is that even though her body had been mutilated um, and I'd had to watch and participate in that, which I also would consider satanic abuse. When I was put in the coffin with her body, I was glad to get to be close to her. I knew, you know, I wouldn't, it was the last time I could be close to her and I remember touching her hair. And one reason I know it's true is if I were writing a story, if I were making up a story about a child being put in a coffin, I would never think that the child would be happy to be close to the corpse. But I didn't consider it a corpse. I considered it my sister's body. And I liked to get to touch her hair one last time. My parents led a complete double life and they went to church three times a week. I was well-dressed at school. Um, there were no bruises where they would have been detected. I didn't remember my abuse except for while it was going on, so I couldn't report it to anyone because I, when it was going on, I was around abusers, and I didn't remember it otherwise, even as a child. Some people with recovered memories remembered their abuse up to a certain age. No, mine was just while I was being abused. I remembered it. Otherwise, I wasn't aware of it. That enabled me to make good grades because, you know, I didn't think about my abuse when I was at school. I was always afraid of my parents and I didn't know why, but I couldn't ever say I was afraid of my parents. So my sister died of cancer. She died of brain cancer. I know she died of the illness because um, I saw her in the hospital. My parents did not murder my sister. I know for sure my parents didn't murder my sister. What happened after she died, I think, is that the funeral home picked up her body, which is usual, pick up the body from the hospital. But what's unusual is they brought it to my childhood church. And in the middle of the night or in the very early hours of the morning, I was, um, I was brought to my childhood church and outside. And um, that's where my sister's body was mutilated with a knife. The knife was placed in my hand and abusers do that to make the child feel responsible for the abuse. It, that was a really hard memory for me because I couldn't imagine how did anyone get me to stab my sister with a knife even though she was deceased. But when I finally remembered it, it was actually very simple. My father said, do it, and I did it. I knew that he had to do what my father said. And that really explains a lot of what they were able to do to me throughout my life was I was told to do it, and, and I did. Um, I don't know if the funeral home owner was in on it, but the employee definitely was. After the incident and before the funeral, I was made to have with the employee from the funeral home. I've tried to find out, like I, I can, I found out who the owner of the funeral home is, and I wasn't able to talk to him, even though the receptionist 
said she passed a message along. He's he's now retired. But I don't know if he was in on it anyway, because on the I have researched this some, so the death certificate has the person's name who was there at, at the time the funeral was officiated. But that could be a completely different person than the person who handled the body prior to it being put in the coffin. So it was a closed casket funeral. I will say after that happened, one thing I know that happened more often was my father would come, would have sex with me at night. Another horrible memory though is, because my sister and I were in the same room, is before she died, my father going to my sister's bed. I mean, both are just horrible. So one of the ways I was abused, and this is common in satanic ritual abuse, was by me being made to witness other children being abused. And one of the incidences that is without question satanic ritual abuse is I was told to bow down to Satan. Now, I didn't want to do that, but I was convinced that if I didn't do it, there was a baby there who would be killed. So I did it. And I remember regaining that memory. I remember God just saying to me, you didn't do anything wrong, Mary. You did nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong. And I know I didn't do anything wrong. And as an adult, if I were in a situation where a child's life was threatened, I would do absolutely anything to avoid the child being harmed. One thing that commonly happens with satanic ritual abuse is that children are put in coffins. And what I know, I'd say this about satanic ritual abuse, is we know it happens because there's so many survivors like myself. But when we start trying to speak out, we're made to appear crazy. And so most people are not willing to speak out about it. I know people who come to me and tell me, disclose to me who I'm in, like, I'm in, uh, I'm on Facebook with them. They don't disclose to anyone else. One was a minister. She said she didn't think her church could handle it. And uh, she did go public about incest, and she did go public about being a survivor of child sex trafficking. But she has not gone public about um, being a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. And so did anyone question that with my parents? Well, No, but there were people who knew about it. There were other people at my childhood church who knew about it. There were other people at my childhood church who did similar things. For example, I was sexually abused by multiple adults on church property because there were other church leaders, including my father. My parents were highly respected at church. Now, not everyone at the church abused children, but my parents weren't the only ones, so it was easy to hide. I don't know that there were multiple employees at the funeral home who were in on it, but I know there was one employee, and um, and it just stands to reason that the owner of a funeral home has to have employees. They can't be available 24 hours a day. No person could do that. But I've heard from other survivors of satanic ritual abuse things that happen inside funeral homes. And, you know, after the incident I told about, I was taken to the funeral home and more things happened to me there, including communion was desecrated. I was told I needed to eat uh, part of my sister's body and uh, drink her blood. I know I was, uh, I was tricked because not too many years ago, I regained a more full memory of that and it was a communion wafer placed in my mouth. It took me a long time to remember the taste of it, but it definitely wasn't my sister's body. It was the kind of communion wafer that is commonly used by Episcopal Church and Methodist Church um, and not the kind of communion. It's not not what we used at my childhood church. So I think they were trying to mess with me to where they would make it to where it was difficult for me to be a member of any church, but they didn't do it. I still like taking communion. It, it's a beautiful Christian ceremony, and um, my views about Christianity have changed and become more liberal, but I still really treasure taking communion. No one besides me, I mean, I have not heard anyone else say my sister's body was mutilated. I do have siblings. Um, They inherited my parents' estate, which was a multi-million dollar estate. Um, I was disinherited. 
I, I don't want to have my sister's body exhumed. She's still my sister. I don't want to do that. If I did try to do it, I don't think I'd be able to because, like I say, a brother of mine is executor of this state. So I, I don't think I could, even if I tried. But the other thing I thought of is how much trickery is you? Because what happened at the church when I know it was my sister's body was soft tissue damage. You wouldn't, You couldn't tell that from exhuming the body. And then what happened at the funeral home when they said they crushed her skull with a, a hammer? I mean, it was total mutilation. But I don't know it was my sister's body. I mean, if my husband was murdered today and they started doing all this torture of me and saying that this was my husband's skull that they were crushing with, I don't know that I, I think they could trick me today. I, you know, I'm 67 years old. I think they could trick me today because I would be in such a emotional state of my, um, of what was happening to my husband's body that I think they could still trick me. So was it really her body or was it someone else's body? And this is what satanic ritual abuse survivors do. I mean, sometimes they use an animal's body and say it's a person's body. And this is another incident I do want to talk about because I would say this is one of the ones that I would say was satanic ritual or could be considered satanic ritual. I do not know that my parents were worshiping Satan. I absolutely don't know that. They never said they worshiped Satan. They said they were Christians and they went to church three times a week. But what they did was they said that they were using fetuses and you know, which I would have considered babies. I was four or five, and I had to stand there while they sacrificed them on this, like an altar. And they were at the top of the hill. I was at the bottom of the hill. But I don't know that those were human. I mean, I don't even know. I, how hard is it to trick a four or five-year-old? And I was standing some distance away. What I remember clearly is that my feet hurt. I remember that I was wearing saddle oxfords, which are hard leather shoes. That's the kind of shoes kids wore at that age. And I remember my feet hurting so bad that I would try to stand different, and then I would try to, I would stand on the side of my shoe and different things because it was so hard to stand for so long. Now, how long was I standing there? I don't know. I was four or five years old. It, it could have been, it, it could have been 15 minutes. That could seem like a long time. They just use trickery so much. And then people report this happened to me and they're not believed. Well, yeah, that's why they trick you. Uh, I know I was raped once by someone wearing a police uniform. I really don't think it was a police officer, but that got me afraid of the police. And I didn't remember that until, uh, well, I remembered, uh, I started remembering abuse at age 37 but yeah that's when I remembered and I really I don't think I have been um sexually assaulted ever by a police officer and I'm yeah I'm now able to to be less afraid but I mean I'd be afraid if I saw a police officer and I was going below the speed limit I would still be afraid and I would slow down um so it it wasn't a rational thing my worst memory is the one of my sister's body being mutilated but if I were going to tell you some of my other memories, you would be surprised they weren't my worst memories. So before that happened to me, one thing that happened, and I tell about it in my memoir, at age six, men came to my house, to my childhood home, and my father took eight millimeter footage of it. My mother took the money from the men. I, re I remember my mom being on the porch and being hand cash by each of the men. And then I was, a rope was put around my neck and the other end of the rope was tied to a tree. My sister and I had witnessed our kittens being killed by hanging. So I knew what happened if they dropped me. And each man abused me and then would hand me to the next man. And I remember, I mean, just, I was really badly hurt. And I, I remember one of the men telling my dad, you went too far, she's gonna die. And I heard that and I hoped I would die. I mean, it was, but I looked over to my mother for comfort and she just looked at me like I was an insect. 
I mean, she just looked at me like I was nothing. And that's when I, that is when I wanted to die. It wasn't after the physical abuse, it was that emotional abuse that my mother just looked at me like I was nothing. And, but that's when I looked up and I saw what I like to believe was God. Some people would say it was a near-death experience and it could have been, I was really badly hurt. And, um, you know, some people would say it was just the sun moving between the clouds or whatever. But um, I felt a connection with God, and that connection has helped me through my life. So, yeah, so that instant had happened, and then my mother brought me in after I was so badly hurt by the group of men, and she bathed me. She put, um, she put me in bed with clean sheets on it, and, you know, I thought things were better, and then she sexually abused me. I mean, you know, it was, it, that was obviously a, a long and horrible abuse that included emotional, physical, and sexual. And I was six. I will never know how often I was abused in rituals. I will never know how often I was abused in rituals. I will never know how often the incest happened. Because, thankfully, I don't have all my memories. I don't ever want to remember everything. It's just too hard. And I believe my memories come from God and they come to me as, as needed. I have memories when it would be helpful to me in my healing or when it would be helpful to another person in their healing. Recovering memories is really hard. I mean, it's emotional, it's really tough. I had hypnosis, which, but it's not the kind of hypnosis like you see on TV. The hypnotist, the psychologist who hypnotized me just got me in a relaxed state. I didn't even realize I was hypnotized because I knew I could get out of it at any time. I knew I could stop any moment I, I wanted to. My ex-husband came to my first session of hypnosis because we just wanted to make sure she wasn't um, telling me what to believe, but she wasn't. And so then after that, rather than him take time off work, it was just better for me to just bring a tape recorder. So that's why I have the tapes. I just wanted, you know, just to know and be able to prove that she didn't lead, ask leading questions, and she absolutely did not ask leading questions. I've transcribed those tapes. There is more known about ritualistic abuse, and that's because people, there's agencies now offering services to child sex trafficking survivors. I didn't know I was a child sex trafficking survivor. I knew my father took pornography of me, but I didn't know that counted as child sex trafficking because he was my father. I didn't learn that I was a survivor of child sex trafficking until after, uh, until I was, well, until after I had done all the filming for my Am I Crazy? My Journey to Determine If My Memories Are True, and I was looking for a fiscal sponsor. Someone suggested a sex trafficking organization, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm not a survivor. And I know so many other survivors of child sex trafficking who did not realize, and uh, adults who were trafficked like by their boyfriend, who didn't realize it was trafficking. So now that that's being recognized, there is a, is a percentage of child sex trafficking survivors who are also survivors of ritualistic abuse. I personally think every survivor of ritualistic abuse I have ever talked to is most likely a survivor of child sex trafficking. You know, they were sold, the money probably exchanged hands or something of value. And the something of value may have been access to other, you know, child victims. I mean, my parents would trade with other people and things like that. So that's still child sex trafficking is whenever um, anything of value is exchanged for the child's innocence. So I was, I was contacted by a sex trafficking organization and they said, w when they knew, they know I'm a survivor and they know I am willing to, I, I'm also a professional, I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker, I can do training. So they asked me to do training because they are getting so many of their uh, clients report ritualistic abuse. I mean, it, it's, 
being so common. And um, one thing they wanted to know, a really good agency, one thing they want to know is, should we put this on our on our initial intake form? And I said, I, I don't think so, because they're not going to tell you right away anyway. People aren't going to say that until they know that they'll be believed. We're, we're so, you know, in the media, in so many ways, we're disbelieved. And so um, I think it's good that, you know, they come in as child sex trafficking survivors and then they get services and then they're willing to disclose. So I really want to be a voice about the satanic ritual abuse. Just published my memoir in November, My Life Now, Essays by a Child Sex Trafficking Survivor. I'm really proud of it. I worked on it for years. The longest essay is How I Healed. People ask me, like, how did you heal? I used to have fibromyalgia. I used to be basically disabled with chronic pain, and I, I'm healthy now. Uh, so I wrote out all so many different suggestions. I wrote out so many things very specific things that help me heal. 